Hello there, uh, my name is Chris, and this um, this video, this audio recording is going to be the first, I uh, plan it to be the first of many um, in a series of artificial intelligence and um, deep learning and uh, machine learning and all those kinds of things. Uh, general educational videos and in the future we'll get into some uh, specific uh, how to design intelligence algorithms and so forth uh, a little bit a little bit later on in the series but uh, for now for today we're just going to concentrate on just the bare bones basics of AI and um, some of its practical applications mostly in healthcare um, there's lots of applications uh, of AI lots of applications and uh, pretty much every single field that you could possibly imagine from healthcare to law enforcement to security to transportation agriculture um, there's in every every type of uh, uh, industry um, there's uh, there's a uh, we're, we're using artificial intelligence and it's just getting just getting started um, in the coming years and the next de decade it, it, we're really going to start to see this thing take off so I, I think it's very important um, that you educate yourself now and um, uh, prepare yourself um, in terms of uh, either professionally uh, to um, take on this um, this this new uh, facet uh, that's going to be part of every day that already is, but uh, even more so um, uh, as 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 the as the years go by. So just to tell you a little bit about me, I'm a graduate student at the University of New Haven, and I also work at Yale University at the School of Medicine um, with uh, a lot of other scientists there to help um, use my artificial intelligence uh, skills to uh, to help in their in their research. Uh, but I'm not going to get too much into that. Uh, that's not the purpose of this video. It's most mainly to um, just give you a general overview of artificial intelligence and um, and so forth. So, but uh, um, first, what we're going to discuss is um, a little bit about what intelligence is exactly, uh, or you know, more precisely. Um, there's a lot of different definitions on when, what intelligence is, but you know, we're, we're going to focus on going to going to keep it keep some parameters on it. You know, otherwise we'll be here all day. Uh, what is art, what is artificial intelligence, of course, and then um, uh, a little bit of history of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence goes back um, a long time, but um, I'm not, so what I'm just going to mention a few few key highlights of, uh, of AI of the history, uh, and then some of the cool things that can be done with with AI today. And um, and then uh, hopefully, if you have any questions, you'll post them, and hopefully I can answer them and get back to you as soon as I can. And, and and we can just take it out. But uh, first, before we begin, and uh, you may have already know this, but uh, there is actually two different versions of, of artificial intelligence. They have what we call weak AI or narrow AI and uh, strong AI or uh, um, what they call general artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Most of the intelligence systems uh, and... Um, Oh, by the way, uh, I'm going to be using artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning somewhat interchangeably. Um, don't take that the wrong way. That's just just for simplicity's sake. Um, there are definite distinctions between artificial intelligence and what uh, you know, data science and machine learning and deep learning. And when when they come out, I will definitely use the correct term and point that out. But just just for simplicity's sake, just I will I will use these terms in, in, interchangeably. Okay. But uh, so anyway. Um, most of the applications that we use that we use every day right now um, focus on what they call narrow or weak artificial intelligence. Um, um, things like uh, your iPhone, um, uh, auto driving cars, um, you know, uh, Cortana from Windows and so forth. Um, um, uh, you know, autopilot systems for, for airplanes. Um, you know, ATMs. These are all examples of uh, of uh, narrow artificial intelligence uh, or weak AI systems. Um, as far as general artificial intelligence goes, um, I mentioned Cortana. I mean, she's supposed to be more of a general AI type of system that can do essentially what what it means is that um, AI is 
well, narrow artificial intelligence can can only do a, a a focused set of things. It can only focus on one domain of certain tasks, you know, like a washing machine or a toaster oven, or like I said before, an auto driving car. They can only do that that specific thing, that specific function. But they cannot transcend those that that um, knowledge or intelligence into other other domains, other facets, like general artificial intelligence can. General AI is more com commensurate to humans, how humans can. When we're young and so forth, we learn, uh, you know, throughout all of our lives, but, you know, we learn to tie our shoe and we learn the alphabet and we learn multiple times tables and so forth like that. And that knowledge doesn't go away. That transcends into other domains of our, of our, of our, um, of our brain and so forth like that. So we are, you know, if you had to compare us to, you know, we would be more considered a general artificial intelligence. Some, some, I don't really know of any practical, um, general AI systems that we have. Um, uh, even even uh, the IBM supercomputer Watson is, uh, even though it, it uh, can do, um, is very knowledgeable in terms of it able to, you know, surf the net and, and um, come up with uh, a, a lot of information very quickly, it's still a very narrow AI system. But if you look at like a lot of your science fiction movies, uh, if you're familiar with with Star Trek: The Next Generation, uh, Data, there was a character named Data, played by Brent Spinner. Um, he's an android, and he was an example of a, of a of a, a general artificial intelligence, something that can learn like a human and learn different different types of things. Um, if you're also, a science fiction buff, you might notice like the Terminator from uh, the, the the Terminator movies. The um, the uh, I think it was called a uh, um, uh, Cyberdyne System One Zero One series. That type of machine, although it's it was made for infantry and, and infiltration and combat, it was also it can it was also it, it, its program was a was a was a type of learning program uh, computer that can uh, learn different different types of of um, uh, domains of knowledge, not just one specific thing. So those are some examples of, of neuro AI and, and, and gen general uh, artificial intelligence, just to kind of give us a little bit of a common frame of reference. Um, but uh, like I said, most of the things that um, uh, that we use today uh, are, are narrow or weak. Uh, in fact, uh, general AI, even though we're working on it, um, there's not really a big big practicality for it um, in terms of commercial use uh, you know even if we do design one it's we have to kind of find a place for it a market for it that people will buy it and then you know what 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 are we going to use it for uh, you know I'm, I'm sure we're going to find a way uh, but um, you know there's there has to be some there has to be a certain level of practicality that we can you know actually use a general AI system for so that's uh, that's one one big caveat there so what is intelligence, though? I mean, uh, are we talking about this person's intelligent, that's intelligent? Uh, what is it? So, well, the definition of intelligence, the ability to learn, to understand, or to deal with uh, new trying situations, uh, the ability to apply knowledge to manipulate one's environment, think abstractly, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the act of understanding. Um, Albert Einstein here says, the measure of intelligence is the ability to change um, you know, we probably have our own definitions of intelligent, uh, uh, a scientist by the name of Jacques Fresco, who was a good friend of mine, uh, used to tell me that uh, intelligence was the ability to extract that which is relevant. So we all have a, uh, uh, um, uh, an idea of what, um, of what, in, of what intelligence is, but, um, and so forth. So a little bit of the, a little bit of the history I want to get into is, um, is, um, a guy by the name of Alan Turing, which you people in the computer industry would, I'm sure, would know. A uh, very brilliant young man. Uh, many years ago, he got into computers, and he's a mathematics um, uh, professor uh, and scientist, and uh, did many things. Um, one of the things he asked uh, was, can computers think? And he ultimately led to the uh, the thought experiment and uh, a... Um, an invention called the the Turing test, uh, which is where it's essentially a measure of uh, the ability of a computer has it reached human level and in intelligence yet. Um, we still use this today as a as a um, you know a, a mainstay for for at least one of them 
to uh, measure measure an ability a computer's ability to uh, to uh, think and reach human level abilities. Uh, the Turing test has been uh, greatly modified and, and changed somewhat since since then. Alan Turing invented this uh, in the 1950, I believe it was the late 1940s. So many a long long time ago. So he was he was way ahead of his time. Uh, very interesting guy. If you read about Alan Turing, uh, I can do a whole presentation on him. But um, that was one of the uh, the big contributions was the, uh, the, the 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 Turing test that that he helped uh, that he helped devise, and uh, is still is still being used uh, is still being used today. Um, but, uh, so, so what is artificial intelligence though? If we have what intelligence is, uh, which is, um, you know, the act of understanding and so forth, what is artificial intelligence? Well, artificial intelligence or AI is, um, is a, a broad field, uh, of computer science, which computer science is even a broader field, <laughs> uh, of, of discipline. But essentially the goal here is to make computers, uh, make more intelligent decisions and act independently from the users without us without us telling them to do every little single detail. So it's essentially giving them the ability to learn by themselves um, and to come up with the uh, the answer by by themselves. And um, you know, there's many there's many there's many different approaches that we can do, that they've uh, taken to accomplish this. And uh, like I said, a lot of them are are being used today. Um, but with the inception of a lot of uh, sophisticated AI algorithms, um, like I said, a lot of them here are being used. This is a Curiosity rover, uh, a, or the rover called Curiosity. Um, this was um, um, uh, a picture there that was, um, this was used on, uh, a long time ago. That uh, we used to explore uh, the, the terrain of Mars. And because of the the signal differentiation, I believe it takes, you know, many hours for a signal from Curiosity to get from Earth to Earth to Curiosity. Um, it was imperative that the rover was able to think for itself to some extent so it can solve, you know, at least at the very least, some, some minor issues that it would come up with and able to to just uh you know uh, act more independently without asking the user uh you know for clarification or, or what is it going to do so uh, for example if the people in nasa um needed uh say curiosity was at one point in in mars and it needed it to be at another point at point b in mars it would just say you're at a we need you at b um, and it was up to curiosity to just figure out how to do it I, you know, just just to get there without asking for any kind of input. So uh, these are some of the uh, examples. Now um, over here, down here, right here is the Asimu robot by by Honda. This is uh, uh, from Jap Japan, um, and this is um, one more contemporary version of a of um, I guess you can call it uh, a supervised uh, or um, a, a neural uh, AI system. And what they're doing is they were really training it to do a um, uh, help with elderly patients and to help them with the, um, you know, commonalities of life, getting out of bed, uh, taking medication, getting dressed and so forth like that. And uh, very expensive, but um, this is uh, really um, a very advanced type of model here. Over here on the right is, is Pepper. Um, this is a um, uh, supposed to be a... Um, uh, what they call an emotional Android or a um, family oriented Android where it, it was made as you can see by its big eyes and, and uh, its figure and so forth like that to be very uh, social. It's what they call a social robot and this display on its chest would be able to also help to express what it was feeling what it was going through but it could also talk and be able to uh, converse with, with uh, humans and so forth like that. So, um, uh, still pretty expensive, but um, like I said, these types of things we'll probably be seeing um, uh, around industries and businesses first until they start to, to be, um, until the cost comes down where um, uh, humans can, um, uh, rather humans, but uh, um, consumers, I should say, uh, can, can afford them. So uh, you'll be probably seeing more and ver probably versions of her too. Um, so getting a little bit to the history of AI, 
uh, Warren McCulloch and Pitts here, these people are neuroscientists who were able to essentially explain how the neuron, which is this this, this um, um, picture here, right here, so how the neuron was able to pass information along its cell um, mathematically. So they invented this this image here at the bottom here called a perceptron. And just for, for common frame of reference, for those of you who don't have a background in biology, um, the way this, this is a, this is a typical uh, rendition of a neuron. There's many different versions of a neuron. That is many different types of uh, how it looks and so forth. This is a, a kind of a, a generic kind of a multipolar neuron, um, which the dendritic factions are here, and then there's the soma or body of it, and then the, the this long tail or axon, and then the, the, the terminals at here. So the way uh, a biological neuron works is that um, it takes in a, a signal from right here, a previous axon from uh, this this right here. You're seeing the terminals here from another axon right here. Like here's here are the terminals. This right here are the terminals from another axon. You know, and it's re getting uh, passing along its signal to the dendrites of this neuron right here, and it's going through the the soma of the body and it, what it's doing is it's generating what they call an action potential and this action potential is actually literally changing the, the polarity the electrical polarity of this of this cell and it has to reach a certain millivolt um, level i believe it's uh, positive 35 before the action potential will fire you understand when it fires this the current or the electrical signal here will go all the way down the axon to the axon terminals or it gets released into the synapse or the, what they call also called the synaptic cleft which is you can't really tell but believe it or not these these appendages here see the blue and the yellow blue and the yellow are not actually touching each other it seems like it but if we actually zoom in really 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 close you'll actually see that there's actually a space between them there's actually a space between them oh, excuse me um if i can zoom in a little bit here can show you a bit more but there's a it it's, it's it seems it, it looks like they're actually touching but in really like this is just a a, a cartoon picture in, in life uh, in a real uh, uh, um, uh, life here that it's it they're actually not touching they're actually there's actually a tiny tiny little bit of space between these two and it's in that space the synaptic cleft a neurotransmitter or is being released and it's being picked up by this these dendrites here the one in yellow here and it's being propagated all the way down to the what they call the axon hillock and being passed along all the way down to the other to the other axon hillock to the next uh, uh, neuron or what we what we call the second order neuron or post uh, uh, synaptic neuron. So just to give it a little bit of frame reference, I'm not going to get too much into the into how it's not it's not that important, but just to give you. Just to explain this, uh, this is the, now the perceptron. These input images act more like the dendritic factions of the the uh, neuron here. And what this does, this input has a weight value attached to it. The weight value and the input, and there's also a bias that's all being added up. When the add up, when the when the all of the uh, factions or the numbers add up to approximately one and thereof this this what they call the summation here will actually fire and it'll fire all the way down to the y what we call the output this is could be commensurate to the axon all right all the way down to the output and right here we're seeing more perceptrons here picking up the signal okay and that's essentially it's not the whole thing of how biological neurons it's not an actual biological neuron but it's just mathematically how they pass along signals that's all uh, pretty much the same as they are today, but they this one came out. Uh, they they invented this. Uh, uh, I believe this was the 1940s that this they invented. So they were way ahead of their time uh, in terms of of, of AI uh, systems, and 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 we really really had a lot of these AI systems uh, and algorithms thought thought about uh, thought through uh, many years ago. We just didn't have the processing power or uh, storage capacity um, uh, to really to really. Um, uh, use a lot of these, but put a lot of these theories to test. Now we do, uh, which is why AI is uh, making, you probably have heard of, you know, past five and six years has really, really been starting to make a comeback, so to speak. Uh, continuing on a little bit here is uh, history of AI is um, John McCarthy, who was um, forced, first coined the term 
uh, phrase uh, artificial intelligence. He actually the first person or one of the first people to come up with that term artificial intelligence. And he invented a, a computer language called Lisp, uh, which stood for list list programming. And it was the first, or certainly one of the first languages uh, that used symbols to talk to computers to get them to do what we to, to do what we wanted. Up until then, we used what they call machine code, which was very awkward and cumbersome, was pro prone to uh, defects and bugs and so forth. Lisp, I don't believe, is used too much anymore. Uh, it may be used in some areas, I'm sure, but uh, it, the vast majority of it now is all Java, Python, PHP, um, uh, C++, software like that. Um, and he came up with an idea to how to make computers smarter by training them to um, play against themselves. I think believe, first he started off with having to play checkers, and then it was chess, and the idea there was that if... Many years ago, the computer scientists believed that if, if you can teach a computer to play chess and you know beat everybody, then it was the epitome of, of uh, intelligence. But that just uh, wasn't wasn't the case, and so forth. But um, which kind of lead segues into my uh, next. This right here is Gary uh, Gasparov, who was back in the mid '90s was one of the um, or the grandmaster chess champion of Russia. Not too fam too familiar with his background, but um, anyway, in 1997 he played against Deep Blue. I said deeper blue. This should be Deep Blue, sorry. Um, <laughs> the, but which was Deep Blue was the IBM supercomputer back then. It's not anymore. But um, played against Gary Gasparov in chess, and he's not looking too happy here because he actually lost against Deep Blue. One of the algorithms that it was able to do was it able to kind of parse through every single possible combination of moves from beginning to end of how chess works. And I believe the average, or not the average, but uh, well, I guess the average, uh, you know, chess uh, player who's good can, I think, uh, a lot, you know, reason out between 10 and 12 moves ahead. Uh, Deep Blue was able to do about 200 million chess positions per second. So, uh, you know, good luck with... Um, with trying to uh, trying to uh, beat uh, a computer in chess, but uh, so there are different types of AI, and here's where we get into uh, a little bit of the specific types of uh, of artificial. These are all what they call sub areas of artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, which are are self learning algorithms that learn uh, models from data. They use statistical algorithms and mathematics to develop a way of solving a problem by analyzing and training data. Um, essentially, what these are are, if you know statistics, uh, which is a mathematical discipline, and essentially what it is, it's just using statistics and computational power, and that's that's really pretty much it. That's that's how um, machine learning is 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 utilized. Uh, it's a single layer. It's on a multi-layered um, type of uh, algorithm, like neural networking is, which is what we're going to talk about now. This is a technology that's inspired by the work of the human brain. Uh, this networks artificial neurons to analyze large data sets automatically to discover underlying patterns without human intervention. This involves feeding a computer system a lot of data, which it can use to make decisions about other data. This logical structure is similar to the, how a human would draw conclusions. Uh, to achieve this, it's also called deep learning, uses a layer structure called algorithms called artificial neural networks. Now, there's all different, different types of artificial neural networks, uh, which are going to talk a few about. Um, other, others are uh, convolutional neural networks or CNNs, uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, CNNs are used for um, recognizing and ca categorizing uh, uh, digital images and video images and so forth, which we're going to talk a little bit about in an, in an example. I'm going to show you uh, one I designed. And recurrent neural networks is good for uh, language processing and uh, uh, predicting um, next language outcomes like you would see in a teleprompter for your TV systems. Uh, actually, hit, most TVs have a, a, a um, option where you could, um, what they call closed captions. Those closed captions, there's actually a recurrent neural network there that's actually um, predicting the next word that's going to be coming out of the, when you're watching the TV, the, the character's uh, um, mouth there. Um, and so these are some of the, um, the uh, different types of, of AI. But there are different styles of learning. Um, and this most of our call, um, this is most, this next slide is mostly it revolves around neural networking. Um, this is not so much as machine learning, but supervised, which is a type of machine learning that enables the model to predict future outcomes after they are trained based on past data. 
the data set has labels to classify and predict them. Um, essentially, what we are is we're trying to, in supervised learning, what we're trying to do is we're trying to map an, in, an input to an output. In supervised learning, we use, don't have to, but we use several hidden layers, uh, which are the layers between the, the um, um, input and the output layer. And uh, essentially what we're trying to do is this helps us to, to process and classify the data better. Best way I can describe this is that if you're showing, if you're a teacher and you're showing uh, uh, your child or your student uh, how to do something, you're taking them by the hand and you're showing them what we want, which is what the output is, what's expected, and this is the data that we're giving you. So we're kind of taking the, the computer by the hand and we're, we're putting it through the network and we're saying this is what we want. Okay, this is what we have is the input, this is what we want. So we're just, we're just mapping it from the beginning all the way to the end and um, with, with what they call labeled data. Well, all the inputs that we're going to use in supervised learning all have inputs, all have labels in their data. Okay, and these labels are helped to classify the data and to show us what we want with, with the output. Unsupervised learning uh, is machine learning is finding patterns in the data to classify data based on just the patterns alone. This, this data has no labels. Most of the data is on, most data today is unlabeled anyway. Unsupervised learning, unlike supervised, we have input labels, but we don't have an output. Unsupervised just has to find the underlying structure, the underlying, uh, uh, to try and classify the data by the inputs alone without using the output. And if you think about it, this would probably be much more useful um, and supervised uh, than uh, than supervised in in a lot of areas because a lot of the data that we collect is is unlabeled and a raw data. Uh, in supervised learning, we have to label the data in order to train the network. But a lot of times we don't. We're kind of we're kind of um, uh, you know in limbo in terms of you know we're not too sure ourselves as humans of what the what the data is. We have to kind of guess and label it ourselves, and our labels could be wrong, so that could that could we can have a, a bad network that's been trained like that. The last style right here is is called reinforcement learning. We're, we're not going to talk about it all, but just for like I said, for just for reference, um, this uh, takes its inspiration from B.F. Skinner's um, environmental conditioning, and where the the neural net only gets feedback if it's if it achieves its goal. Uh, this is leading, like what I said, to environmental conditioning and interaction from the environment itself. The environment, in other words, is the teacher for the for the network. Um, it's interesting. This actually got most notoriety in, in game theory that um, game designers uh, would use reinforcement learning algorithms um, to create games and so forth like that. Um, so today we're just starting to. Um, to use this uh, uh, practically and so forth like that, but it's very different from uh, supervised and unsupervised learning. So just keep keep that in mind. So now some of the uses there. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on the history of AI. So we're going to get into the histories and uh, or sorry the uses of, of AI applications. And like I said, there's a lot of different uh, applications, uh, and even in healthcare. Um, you know, one of the things that we can use is that they can, can manage medical, help to manage medical records um, and um, um, organize data from people um, with, if you're a healthcare provider, to uh, help people if you have a lot of patients and most patients have a lot of data. <laughs> and uh, it can help organize that data. And it can actually even help to collect and it can store, reformat the data. It can give, um, it could, help to um, design treatments. It can help to, um, uh, like I said, design, help to um, the doctor, or the healthcare provider, whoever it is, to um, um, uh, give a, a, a good patient outcome, history, or um, help, to help the doctor decide the, the best patient care that they can give them. Um, like I said, with, net, with natural language processing, uh, it can read through databases of scientific articles. Uh, right here on the side here, this is actually how like a, an uh, NLP or an RNN could actually sift through the data and highlight the most essential elements and form a prognosis or opinion. Um, this right, this this report right here would be like maybe like what uh, a, a nurse or a health or a doctor might 
put in about a patient after they've 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 um, um, done some run some tests on them, or has um, uh, interviewed them and so forth like that. And this is what's over here on the right here is uh, what they call structured data or something like a data like a database would be an example of a structured um, uh, 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 data here, which is you know probably something that is already has been implemented, and this can what's happening here is that the computer is deciding like what disorders the person has based on the information here and that's already hiding highlighting the possible um medications that the person uh could be prescribed or, or is prescribed um and what the possible um um uh, ailments that the patient has um like i said and there's all sorts of things this and and, and as a result this can give the healthcare providers a lot more time to do um um, other other things, maybe other things that um, really require a human human level uh, um, interaction. The the healthcare providers can can um, focus on that and leave this. It's not trivial. It's very important, but um, you know um, other level um, 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 stuff for the uh, you know for for computer systems and so forth. Um, in um, in, in, um, uh, in scientific research, uh, especially in genomics and so forth like that, we're always looking and seeing how different proteins um, interact with each other and um, interact with uh, certain body tissues that we have and so forth like that. And everything starts with proteins from our DNA. Our DNA tells the, the proteins uh, which proteins to make and so forth like that. So what protein-protein interaction networks, this would be a good uh, um, time to use unsupervised learning. Um, is that these are mathematical representations of the physical contacts between proteins in the cell. Um, this, the, the, uh, the solid line bars here that you're seeing that connects other proteins to other proteins, these, these data points are proteins, by the way. These little dots are here. Um, and the broken lines are the uh, indicates in, indirect actions between proteins and so forth like that. But uh, it would take a long time for even a scientist to know what they're doing to kind of weed out and... Uh, sift through all this data and this is a very nice picture by the way there's other pictures i found on the internet examples that were very very much more complicated this is a very very nice rendition picture in terms of being able to see and read everything and stuff like that but trust me they're much much more complicated than this um but uh, it would take a scientist who even knew what they're doing a long time to kind of figure uh, figure all this thing out. But like I said, protein-protein interactions are very uh, important. Uh, they're very they're crucial for understanding cell physiology in normal and disease states. So they're very important to, for helping us understand what's going on and, and for um, um, making treatments and therapeutics and so forth like that. Because if we can see the interaction, if we were going to give administer a therapeutic, which proteins it interacts with and what what the interaction will do down down, down the line um, this is uh, what I did uh, as, as an independent study for school several semesters ago I did what they call a, a CNN or a convolutional neural, neural network and as I said before um, CNNs we use them for to recognize digital photographs um, and classify digital images uh, uh, based on the picture alone and um, what I did here was, uh, these are pictures of chromosomes. And at the end of there, just for, for those of you who don't know, these bright tips that we're seeing right here are what they call telomeres. Telomeres are part of the, uh, the DNA structure. They're at the ends of the, the they're called, actually called the caps of the, of the chromosomes. And what, we, what they do, or what we think they do, is that they protect chromosomes from, from um, protects your DNA from aberrations and mutations and stuff like that. And uh, it's hypothesized, uh, and it's been proven in many instances, uh, that the, the shorter these uh, the telomeres get, not the chromosomes themselves, but the actual telomeres, uh, if we zoom in really, really uh, high on this, we'd actually be, so we could see the length better, but this is just, this is just an overall view. Uh, we can measure a person's health and biological age uh, by the length and the, um, the shape of their, of their, of their chromosomes. Uh, and by contrast, if they're uh, short and stubby and they're not even there, we can tell that the, a patient is unhealthy or very old and stuff like that. If you see the bottom picture here, um, a lot of these chromosomes doesn't appear to even have any um, uh, telomeres. So um, I did a uh, I designed a CNN that would actually um, help 
uh, indicate whether the person, the biological age of the person, whether the person was healthy or young or, or old and um, and uh, unhealthy. So what I did was I gave it, um, you know, hundreds of pictures of, of telomeres, both uh, pictures of chromosomes, both um, uh, uh, with with long, healthy telomeres like this, and with short uh, um, uh, and unhealthy telomeres like like that. Um, and a lot of the pictures were different. They weren't. They didn't all look like this. They were very different. They could have used a different uh, um, what they call uh, this is called fish or what they call um, fluorescent situ hybridization. Um, and it's a way to uh, look at um, um, pictures at uh, at a very very uh, uh, high level. Uh, they, they highlight um, uh, these with certain um, uh, uh, colors. That uh, when you run a current through them, um, it 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 brings that the the the, the details of the um, of the image out. So so I showed him many different pictures of both the healthy telomeres and unhealthy telomeres, and at the end I was actually able to um, um, it, you know sh test it on a set of data and actually um, show that it can that the CNN can actually identify. Uh, people who have uh, short versus versus long telomeres so but essentially the way um, the way um, CNN's work is that uh, if you give a picture right here this picture is actually analyzed pixel by pixel and only the most essential pixels and that each pixel has a certain uh, numeric value attached to it the higher the value the more the more important quote unquote is and it takes that takes that pixel out. And it goes all the way through, all the way through, pixel by pixel, taking the most essential pixels out and pools them into one layer. It then gets these um, uh, pixels, it gets, it, 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 this forms then a, a smaller version of the previous version, and then it does the same exact thing. It just keeps pooling, it keeps, keeps uh, uh, pulling out the, um, the uh, most important values, the most important pixels, okay, and it brings it even to another um, a smaller value, but a more uh, concentrated value, if you will. It's then brought to a classifier where it's then classified or categorized into whatever uh, categorization or classification that you that you have designated. You would have to set this up to be, to begin with, and then that's basically in a nutshell how how, how they work. And uh, we're just this is basically just used for, um, like I said, digital uh, um, identification and so forth like that, and even videos and so forth. So um, big use in the field, CNNs, uh, very interesting how they work. We've actually been trying to um, replicate, in a sense, how uh, the, the occipital region of the brain works. We believe that that's essentially how it works, is that uh, the occipital region of our brain, as we look at things, we look at faces and images and how we identify things, it's, we're only pulling out the most essential elements and the rest is being, is being discounted. That's the same thing what we're trying to replicate here, is we're just trying to pull out the most essential elements and then, you know, classify it or categorize it as, uh, as, as uh, humans would do, or well, how we believe we do. Um, and pretty much that's that's all I had uh, for today. Um, I'll leave you with that. If uh, I failed to uh, explain anything, please comment below and let me know. And uh, like I said, this is going to be the first of many. Um, so just uh, stand by for more. And uh, with that, um, take care. Thanks for your attention.